everyone, and thank you for waiting. I'm here with Duncan Pritchard, who's been on before. You're an epistemologist um, over at UCL in UC or is it UCLA. Have I said the wrong? No, yeah, UCI, UCI Irvine. It's, it's oh, University UCI. Sorry, right. <laughs> U U University of California, Irvine. Um, and today we're going to be talking about skepticism. So um, you've got two resources out, which off the back of this, if people are interested, they probably want to check out. Um, one being the very short introduction to skepticism, which you've written. And the second one being a Coursera course on skepticism, uh, which, which you've done, which both kind of broadly cover some of the topics we're going to touch on today. So I guess the first thing to, to ask is what is skepticism? Yes, hi Nathan. Thanks for having me on the show again. Um, skepticism is about it's about doubt. Um, it's about I mean, the philosophers were interested in 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 doubt of a kind of systematic way, so not just localized individual doubts, but you know what in general is it about makes people doubt, makes people reasonably doubt. What kind of systematic doubts might there be about certain domains? You know, doubts about I don't know, perception or memory or religious belief, as we talked about before, or maybe doubts about belief in general, um, which is the sort of radical skeptical scenario. And there's also skepticism. Uh, another issue is about skepticism and its role in, in, in a good life, right? So what, it, right. what role might doubt play in living a good life? So, um, I mean, when, when you're talking about skepticism and, you, you know, like, for example, coming to write this book, um, was it difficult do you think you went straight in with like a, how ph philosophers would talk about skepticism or really is the idea here to broadly encompass what people mean by skepticism and use philosophy as, you know, a, t a tool for understanding that? Yeah. It, so a bit, a bit of column B, I think, rather than column A. So I have a, a lot of my work is actually on skepticism. I have a monograph, my recent, my recent monograph, Epistemic Angst, Radical Skepticism, The Grounds of Our Believing, came out a few years ago. Princeton University Press is almost exclusively about the skeptical problem. But that's a very technical, you know, technical topic. Uh, whereas the the OUP series, the very short introduction series, is aimed at the general reader. You're not allowed any. They're, they're very brutal with you. You're not allowed any terminology whatsoever. Or well, anything okay. you don't explain. So I had to try and think about how these um, the skeptical debate relates. And what I tried to do was to connect it to some live debates in social thought. You know, things like post facts and so forth. It seems to me a lot of um, a lot of the challenges we face what we used to call generally relativistic challenges, but they've, they've taken on a different flavor in the sort of social media age. I mean, like post-facts, post-truth, all this kind of thing. I think often they're trading on skeptical arguments and uh, in, in, in illicitly trading on skeptical arguments. So badly, there are good skeptical arguments. That, these are bad skeptical arguments. And so what I tried to do was relate some of the philosophical literature on skepticism to that, to try and get people to see the utility of thinking about skepticism in, in terms of thinking about some of these issues. So that, yeah, I, I guess that broadly also covers, um, you know, why we should want to study um, skepticism in order to sort of not fall foul of people who are, who are using these arguments to kind of manipulate or coerce and things like that. Um, so if we, to, to sort of get started in, ter in terms of this philosophical skepticism then, there'll often be skeptical hypotheses, skeptical thought experiments which are put forward. I mean, what, what are they and how are they used by skeptics? So there's a very radical form of skepticism which says that it's, um, it's kind of the, the funnest form of skepticism. It says, how is it possible to know anything at all? And it trades on these hypotheses. So these are scenarios, skeptical hypotheses, scenarios where everything subjectively is exactly as you think it is, but you're radically in error. So think about like the Matrix or something like that, you know. Remember the uh, in the Matrix, uh, and, and philosophers have a version of this called the brain in a vat, the person thinks they're having all these experiences of a world around them. In fact, they're just a disembodied brain or something, or I think it's a body in the in the mat, in the the Matrix floating in a, in a vat, which is being fed these experiences. And what's crucial about it is that these scenarios are indistinguishable from ordinary life. Now, the skeptic isn't saying that you're in that scenario. They're not saying it's likely that you're in that scenario. They're not making any claim about its plausibility at all. They're just simply saying, look, it's possible. And how do you know it's not true? And of course, if by hypothesis, we can't tell the difference between ordinary life and the skeptical scenario, then it seems like, well, how do we know then? We can't know. And so the skeptic says, well, look, if you can't know that, well, Anna, how do you know 
I mean, for example, right now, I take myself to know that I've got two hands. Right? They're right in front of me. I can feel them. But of course, if I have a brain in a vat, I don't have hands. Right? I don't merely seem to have hands. I've just got vat images or something like that, whatever's right. going on to the, the brain that's floating there in the vat of nutrients. So that belief that I've got is false if I am in the brain in the vat. Right. Um, so, so if I can't exclude that error possibility, then it calls into question how I could possibly know this claim. So I guess the important thing to highlight there is this idea that um, to to know something, it has to be incorrigible or something like that. You have to not be able to doubt it. Or is it, am I getting the wrong? Is it, you're shaking your head. No, no, no. So, so, some people, so, so some people make that move. They say, aha, okay. So the skeptic has really high standards of knowledge. They think in order to know something, you've got to have like in, be infallible or as you say, incorrigible. So it can't be proved upon or indubitable. It's... You can't doubt whether or not. Uh, but actually, the skeptic isn't. I mean, this this is one of the, I think really important to understand in skepticism. It looks like they're doing that. It looks like they're raising the standards, but actually, I don't think they are. I mean, no, normally that's how it works, right? Normally, if you if you claim to know something and someone comes along with an error possibility, then it's reasonable to say, well, what? How do you how do you how do you rule that out? Right. So, you know, if I'm at the zoo and I see a zebra and someone says, well, you know, there's these fake zebras around at the moment. They look like zebras. Do you not hear about this? It's been in the newspapers. These fake zebras, they look like zebras. They're really, they're really mules because, they're you know, let's say there's a shortage of zebras. So they've taken yeah. to using disguised mules. And then you might say, well, how do you know it's a zebra? Why well, do you know it's one of the real ones? Right. And, and normally, of course, you can you can discharge their responsibility. You can say, look, you know, this isn't one of those zoos. It's, it's those zoos down Across the border that do that, right. it's not easy. Or you might say, "Look, I've been up enough and had a look close up. It's not, it's not one of those, or something like that." Or you might say, "Look, I'm a zoologist. I, I can tell the difference between zoos and do zebras and clothes guys meal." Right. So normally, that's a, a normal practice. You know, someone has, you know, they, they think they know something. Someone comes along and says, "Well, look, here's an error possibility," and then it's up to you to rule it out. And it seems like, on the face of it, at any rate, that's all the skeptics do. And they're not saying you have to infallibly rule it out or you have right. to rule out every possibility there. They're just saying, look, here's one. How do you know? I mean, it's yeah. possible, right? Um, it's just that we don't know the denials of the radical skeptical hypothesis. That's For, for yeah. all we know, it could be the case that we're, we're in error in this way. And, and in fact, they, they appeal to a, pro, a principle here. It's called uh, closure, which is very plausible. It's independently plausible, you know, independent of skepticism, which is if you know one thing, you know and tell something else, then you know that's something else, right? So if I do know I've got hands, and I know that if I've got hands, I'm not a brain of that, well, then I must know I'm not a brain of that. But of course, the, the danger of closure is you can run it in reverse, right? The skeptic can say, well, hang on a minute, you don't know you're not a brain of that, so you don't know you've got hands. Right. And, and this is, yeah, this, so this print, so the, the, the skeptic says, look, here's something you don't know, and that seems right, and they say, here's a principle we all accept, closure. But if you put the two things together, you don't know you've got hands. In fact, you don't know anything, really, because just about everything you believe is incompatible with some skeptical scenario. And it's really difficult to say, well, what exactly is wrong with that? It doesn't seem, there's no raising of standards there. It's just a, the application of familiar principles that we, we, we use in everyday life. So, so just to articulate that closure, closure principle, is it, is it referred to as the epistemic closure principle or the, or the closure principle just as... Yeah, it's different name, closure for knowledge. It, it's called closure because the idea is knowledge is closed, as it were, under known entailment. So if you know something, you know it tells something else, then you know what's entailed. Um, so as I say, you know, if you if you if you know that um you've got two hands, you know, you've got two hands, you know a brain of that, because brain of vats don't have hands, then you must know you're not a brain of that. Or conversely, if you can't know you're not a brain of that, then you can't know you've got hands. Um it, it's it's a kind of principle closure. Normally we use it. It's completely uncontentious. And it's sort of like a philosophical discovery to realize that you can plug skeptical scenarios into it. And suddenly it has this, normally it has no dramatic consequences at all. It's almost trivial. And then you plug these skeptical scenarios in. It seems to have this dramatic consequence because it seems to say, well, either I know something I never thought I could know, or if I grant that I don't know it, as the skeptic says, then I don't know even mundane things. So, so that's, um, that's, that's closure-based skepticism. That's one version of skepticism. And I think that's actually a quite a powerful version. Um, it doesn't appeal to high standards or anything, but it, it looks very compelling. So I'm wondering, um, do a lot of these skeptical hypotheses then 
um, they depend upon that to get off the ground. So, so do do you tend to get? Do you ever get skeptical hypotheses where people are kind of putting them forward? But um, uh, you know, as part of that, I suppose it's also like, well, maybe the closure principle itself is in doubt. So, so when the person is appealing to the closure principle to kind of run it backwards, as it were, you just go, well, you know, for all we know, the closure principle is wrong as well. <laughs> yeah, although that that's not going to help. Um, okay. I, I, I can see why you might initially think it's. It might seem like it's going to help, but. The way to think about the skeptical puzzle is that it really it's a paradox, or it looks like a paradox. Anyway, it's a, a putative paradox. The things about paradoxes is that they're tensions that are internal to your own ways of thinking. So it doesn't matter to a paradox whether there's anybody out there arguing for them or not. I mean, the thought is you can just, in your own head, you can think, well, I'm committed to this, and I'm committed to that, and I'm committed to this. Hang on. They're, but they can't all be right. Right. And that's really the structure of the skeptical problem. I mean, we, we we cast it dialectically. You know, we think of there being a skeptic who we're arguing with. Yeah. Well, but there's a danger of thinking like that because then you can think, oh, well, the skeptic has commitments of their own, and you know, maybe the view undermines itself. But but properly understood, I think it's not really a view; it's just a tension within our own ways of thinking. So you don't need any skeptic. You can just reflect on it yourself. And I think this is part of the power of it. You know, if you think of it as as something an adversary is trying to convince you of, then you might say, well. To hell with that, right? I'm not interested. But once you realize, actually, there's an inconsistency in your own ways of thinking. I mean, your own way, our own ordinary ways of thinking seem to be committed to the fact that we know lots of things, to closure, but also to the fact that we can't know the denials of these skeptical hypotheses. But they can't all be true. So which of them has to go? And that's the puzzle, right? I mean, as with all paradoxes, right, these seems something intuitive has to be denied. And the puzzle then is to work out, well, well how? So it's, it's interesting that... Um... You know, you mentioned we cast it in this di this dialectical context, um, but really the question is to contemplate it ourselves and see where it leads us. Now, I mean, it, so do you think what's going on there fundamentally is some people are sort of trying to find their way out of these skeptical hypotheses, saying we have to have knowledge, and some people just share different intuitions, and so they go, "Well, I'm just going to run it the opposite way." Um, and well, they, they, you know, they can just... do. I mean, there, there's a certain common sense view which is associated with more, which basically privileges the ordinary judgments that we know lots of things, and then says, "Well, then obviously, and clo so it privileges that privileges closure, and then says, so it must be then that we do know the denials of skeptical hypotheses." Um, the challenge, though, for that is to explain how, right? Because right. ordinarily, knowledge, you know, if if you can't tell the difference between A and B then you don't know the difference between A and B, right? And if you don't know the difference between A and B, you can't know that you're in A rather than B. Um, I mean, that's just a, that, that just seems like normal epistemology and application. So you, well, you I think, oh, sorry. I, I guess, just, uh, you have to come up with a revisionist epistemology to explain why, why it is you can know you're not a brain in a vat, even though you have no way of telling whether or not you're a brain in a vat. I, I guess it, within my question, I was considering someone who might really identify with... Um, being a skeptic for whatever reason so they might have just this really really high credence or maybe some other reason to be committed to the skepticism so as we kind of layer together these seeming these deductions say they're just going to say well uh, they're always going to find something wrong you know they're always going to run them the other way is there any way to convince someone who's that committed to skepticism you know that they, they'd even be denied to they, they'd even be prepared to maybe reject the you know like law of excluded middle or something just to say well the you know the deductions themselves they don't work i'm skeptical of those or yeah i mean I, i'm of the view that um it's not possible to be a skeptic in that sense the radical so it's like it's just psychologically not possible right um so you can say it you know you can say i doubt everything right but it's just words uh, so I'm quite Wittgensteinian about right. this. I think our, our, our behavior, our actions reveal as an underlying certainty. Um, and, and as it were, there's now a disconnect between the things we say. And our beliefs really are tracking, you know, it's, it's clear from our behavior, we do really believe these things. Now, but I don't, so, so, so when people say that, I think they're, they're just kind of kidding themselves. And it's like, like sort of philosophical fiction. Yeah. Um, and I think actually understanding why it's a philosophical fiction is really important to, to resolving the puzzle. But, but not not because um, it, you know immediately follows. Well, if it's a philosophical fiction, then it, it, radical doubt must be wrong. Because maybe it's right. It just you can't do it. You know, you know maybe it's true. We don't know anything, but we just can't consistently believe it. I mean, I think like free will is a bit like this, right? People who deny that we have free will 
I mean, that's kind of, it just makes no sense, right? What does it mean? You know, I've thought about it long and hard and I've decided that free will doesn't exist. That makes no sense at all. Of course, it could be true that free will doesn't exist, but it just it makes no sense. You yeah, there's a about consistent it set of propositions that you can put together, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so the same here, you know, it could be true that we don't know anything, but at the same time, it can't be the sort of thing you can actually consistently believe, right? Um, but I think... So it's not that it follows immediately that you can get a way out of skepticism by noticing that it can't be believed consistently. But I think it is important to understanding how you unravel it. There's something odd going on here. Uh, and it's important to work out exactly what it is. So another approach to dealing with skeptical concerns that you mentioned is the contextualist response. So, uh, I mean, what does the contextualist have to say? And um, I think also you've got some reasons for sort of rejecting maybe the contextualist response is not as strong as the um, the kind of common sense closure principle response. Yeah, I mean, the problem with contextualism looks plausible, and it looks plausible for the reason that you alluded to earlier, which is that it feels as if the skeptic's raising the standards. It feels as if ordinarily, I mean, certainly true, ordinarily we don't consider skeptical scenarios. We just don't. We just consider local error possibilities. So it feels like this person comes along and starts raising these radical error possibilities. It feels like they've changed the game somehow. They've raised the standards. If that were true, then I think contextualism would get a grip here. Because what contextualism says is that no is the word. So it's primarily a claim about language. It says the word no picks out different, different things in different contexts. So sometimes it picks out a high standard thing. And sometimes it picks you know, so the concept, a high standard concept of knowledge, and sometimes it picks out a low standard. And the thought is that when we ordinarily talk, we say we know things in ordinary context, we're using the low standards, knows. And then when the skeptic comes along, they raise the standards, and so they say you don't know, and they also speak truly because they they've now switched it to the high standards. Right. And we, as it were, we accommodate them. So there's like sort of practice of accommodating other people when standards get raised. So we we now adopt their standards, and so we think, well, it's true, we don't know. But then, as Hume remarked, you know, once you stop, you know, doing philosophy and start playing backgammon, all your doubts disappear. And what happens is you go back down to the low standards context again. So it can be both true in everyday sense that you know things, but also false in, in the high standard sense you know things. And it looks like that solves the problem, but it doesn't because skepticism isn't trading on standards. There's no high standards here. I mean, if the skeptic, here's the way to think about it: if the skeptic's right, you don't know anything, even against the lowest possible standard. Lower the standards as much as you like, you still don't know anything. Lowering the standards doesn't help you at all. I mean, what the skeptic is saying, basically, is that you have no reason. At all. I have no reason at all for thinking I've got hands. Because any reason I have would have to be a reason thereby for thinking I'm not a brain of that. But I've got no reason to think I'm not a brain of that. So I've got no right. reason to think I've got hands. You know, I've got no more reason than the brain of that has. You know? Um, so you don't meet any standard at all. So contextualism, it, it, it's based upon a misunderstanding of the skeptical problem. It thinks the skepticism is raising standards that we, we know relative to low standards, but not relative to high ones. The skeptic's right. It's nothing to do with standards. We don't know relative to any standards. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's this idea that, you know, if you're sort of distracted in a different in a different context where um, no might have this different sense, it's not it's still not really um, addressing the skeptic's concerns because they still apply. You're just distracted with uh, the shadows on the wall or whatever, as far as the skeptic's concerned. Um. So I suppose the next thing to to talk about off the back of this is um, well, you talked about a bit a bit of a, a few of the historical concerns um, of skepticism. So I don't know if it would be useful to outline some of those as well. So some of the kind of ancient skepticisms and how we can learn from those to inform our view as modern people um, who are looking at skepticism. So the radical skeptical view, the one I just presented, is it's very Cartesian. Uh, it's it, it, was, it wasn't It was presented as a position. It was presented as kind of like a, a methodological thing. It was a way of sort of testing your theory of knowledge. Descartes presented this radical challenge. He thought he could meet it. But as often happens in philosophy, his response to the challenge wasn't persuasive, right. but the challenge was. The challenge survives. Um, but he wasn't claiming this was a way of life or something like that. Um, it was meant to be just like a sort of theoretical puzzle. But in ancient thought, there is a kind of skepticism which isn't quite as radical but which is a way of life. It was the Peronian skepticism, and I think it's fascinating. Um, they didn't write any books because it, it makes no sense for them to write books uh, if you don't believe you know anything. Um, but they, uh, they were very influential, and other people wrote books about them. In particular, uh, we have two main sources. 
uh, Sextus Empiricus's book, which is really interesting, outlines of Pyrrhonism. And it, they, the Pyrrhonians crop up in other books as well, like Diogenes Laetius' uh, Lives of Philosophers. Uh, Pyrrho himself, and I find this fascinating, he traveled with Alexander the Great uh, on his campaigns into the East. Basically, he inter interacted, when we think about you know ancient Greek thought as being sort of insulated, it was very, it was very open, I think, to Eastern influences, and it's very clear in the, in the case of Pyrrho. His ideas effectively come from ancient uh, South Asian uh, mysticism, sort of uh, Jainism and sort of proto-Buddhism that was around at the time. I mean, basically what he does is he takes those 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 ideas and he, and he, he strips them of all the sort of meditative spiritual aspects and he, he, he extracts a kind of ethical doctrine. And roughly the thought is that the good life is a life of doubt. I mean, as, as he would put it, we think of skeptic, skeptic, the skeptic as a doubter, but the original word actually means inquirer. And the way the Peronians understood it is that skepticism is a kind of perpetual inquiry. You never, you, you're never on the one hand, you know, you never dogmatic. You never have settled opinions, right? You're constantly in the state of of uh, having convictions and then opposing them, convictions and opposing them, equipoise as they call it. And um, and so you. You, that that kind of it's it's that that gives you the the, the ataraxia the the, the, the the calmness of mind, right? And that's that's the eudaimon. The good life is the calmness of mind you get by not having these commitments. So, so they contrast themselves with academic skeptics who say you don't know anything. Um, they thought that was a different that was dogmatism of a negative kind. So there's dogmatism of the positive kind, and there's dogmatism of the negative kind. Whereas they they just keep on inquiring. They don't have no commitments at all. And so they managed to keep themselves in that state of having no commitments through the, the application of what they call the skeptical modes, these sort of practices of doubt. And it's fascinating, you know, how far can... So the skeptic, the Peronian skeptics have this challenge, how far can you push this, right? I mean, that, as they recognize, there are some things you can't doubt. Um, I mean, there's descriptions of Pyrrho, you know, nearly walking, I mean, that's probably apocryphal, right. nearly walking into the volcano, you know, and things like that having to be guided. But, you know, in order to live, there are some convictions you need to have, and maybe they're not susceptible to doubt but the idea is you find the things that can be doubted and as much as you can you do and that life of doubt is the good life and and you know th th this idea gets it gets rediscovered in the early modern period i mean especially with montaigne and his essays um popkin and he's, he has this magisterial study of um of the history of skeptical thought richard popkin and he talks about montaigne's work especially his apology for raymond saban which was his sort of theodistic defense of religious belief Okay. He, he talks about this as the womb of modern thought because this was basically the rediscovery of these Peronian techniques. And uh, they become really influential now on, 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 on ideas, like, you know, people like Hume and so on, yeah. Yeah, really t absorb a lot of these Peronian techniques and it, it guides their thinking. And uh, you know, arguably a lot of the, what we think of that as, a, as important about the Enlightenment era is driven by these Peronian skeptical techniques and application. So, you know, there's something to that thought that the good life is a, is driven by doubt. You know that it, it the dogmatism is where is the enemy of the good, and right. and you avoid dogmatism by having this by having this attitude of perpetual doubt of never, never, never being convinced of anything and ensuring that you aren't right. As that's Montaigne it's, tried to live his life that way. It, it, it's interesting. Um, I mean, I'll comment this quickly and then lead us into the last question because we've not got much time. But um, I remember reading something about perhaps uh, one of the motivations behind, um, I mean, obviously Descartes trying to come up with the, the method but um, to, to support his sciences, but also perhaps one of his motivating factors being some of these Pyrenean texts kind of floating around um, in his time. And interesting, the similarities between the kind of argument he offers. And I was reading some of um, Augustine's work, like where he comes up with the Kigito in soliloquies, but then um, he was also responding to people like uh, some of these skeptics, Zeno you know, of Citium. And it, th there seem to kind of be these, these cycles of thought where people are trying to kind of find certainty and respond to the same kind of skeptical um, queries over time. And it, maybe we're in a similar sort of pattern of thought um, now, I wanted to, the, with the, le the last question was, well, I suppose, what is the antidote um, to this in, in your view? So the, this kind of idea of virtue epistemology or the virtues that um, we ought to cultivate as epistemic agents um, trying to form true beliefs and why we should form these true beliefs. So I think the, the radical skeptical view, uh, this Cartesian view, I think that has a response. It's quite a technical response. I think that the answer lies in Wittgenstein fundamentally and in 
we have to unravel some of the sort of faulty ways of thinking that lead us into this puzzle. We have to basically understand why this looks paradoxical. It looks like it's it's kind of being generated by common sense, but it isn't. And that, that takes a lot of a lot of conceptual work actually to untease all the different connections. So that's what I talk about in my my epistemic angst book. The the more moderate kind of skepticism though is is I think just as interesting, the kind that, that we we find in everyday life where I mean, people might purport to doubt everything, but they're using the, they don't really doubt everything. They're using it as a way of sort of political control or something like that. This is a sort of post facts kind of way of doing it. Getting people to doubt things, or think about climate change, you pick any topic you like. There's always someone out there. It's in their interest to motivate skepticism because they're trying to generate, um, they're trying to generate certain, they have some political objectives and they want to promote skepticism because it serves those objectives. So I think what we need to do, the virtuous inquirer has to understand what role skepticism has in, in, in the intellectually virtuous life. So this is a, the intellectual virtues are certain truth directed, uh, admirable character traits, and they include things like integrity, intellectual humility, um, uh, intellectual tenacity, intellectual courage, and so on. These are traits I think that good, in, good inquirers have. They're, people who care about the truth and want to get to the truth and care about accuracy. What's interesting is a lot of those traits have a skeptical dimension to them. You know, I think intellectual humility involves a sort of recognition of one's fallibility and openness to other people's ideas, you know, a willingness to be sort of charitable to opposing ideas, try and work them out in their, their strongest form, um, a willingness to change, you know, to change one's opinions, not be dogmatic and so on. So I think what the, that virtue, the intellectual virtue framework gives us is a way of thinking about how a kind of moderate doubt could play a role, a moderate skepticism could play a role in a good life. You know, how, how to keep a moderate skepticism from being a positive force, uh, because clearly it is. I mean, it's what drives science, it's what drives progress of many kinds, I think social, political, scientific progress. But you have to, how, how to have it in such a form that it's moderate and it doesn't become the more dramatic version, which I think is actually destructive, you know, which says, you know, there's no such thing as facts, or the, you know, it could take any well-established scientific view that it's it must be wrong because you know plug in your conspiracy theory and so on. So it's that it's that balancing act, and I think virtue theory gives us a way of understanding what's going on there. I mean, the, virtue is all about the balancing act of of avoiding the two extremes: the extreme of lacking virtue and the sort of excessive traits that can be associated with the virtues. It's the, the golden mean, as Aristotle called it. I think something similar is happening in the intellectual case: a way of the virtuous person finds a way of using skepticism to serve the good such that it doesn't become extreme and undermines the good. Right. Well, I think for today, we'll leave it there because I um, sort of messed up the times and uh, at, at half an hour into the time when we should have, um, it should have been brought an at half an hour earlier. So sorry about that, everyone, because some people have been saying, uh, will there be time for questions and things at the end? But I think uh, you said you were willing to come on again at some point so we can... Yeah, did they have to come back? Yes, yeah, so sorry. Well, I maybe... I have a oh, well, I was oh, going to say, maybe... Well, I have one, I suppose. We've, we've got a minute or two, right? Okay. Um, let me see if I can find... Um, Oscar has asked... And I guess we could, we could maybe do like an epistemology Q&A. Um, oh, it's not coming up when I click on it for some reason. Um, I'll just read it out, line, out, out loud. Um, Oscar says, could I deny... If I am a brain in a vat, I don't have hands. Seems like there are two different contexts. The outer context of the vat world, where I, oh, it's popped up now, where I don't have hands, and the inner context where I do. Yeah, I mean, I mean if, see, if you are in the vat, you, you literally don't, there's no, there's no context relativity to it. You don't have hands. I mean, what you could say is that, I mean, I think this might be what you're getting at, that there's, what you, ha you have something, you have something different. So, so that, as it were, us hopefully in the real world we have physical hands whereas the vat person has something they have like you know vat image hands or something like that and you can make that line i mean and and so one thought might be does it really matter whether you have the real hands the physical ones or the vat image ones uh dave chalmers who's a very important philosopher contemporary philosopher has, has made this point maybe it doesn't matter it seems to me it does matter uh for the same reason i don't know if you're familiar with nozick's experience machine i think it matters whether or not you're to a good life, whether you're in the machine or not. So a lot of people think, well, look, if the machine is, the life in the machine is just like the life outside the machine, what does it matter, you know, subjectively? But I think it does, it matters, like, forget about hands for a minute. <laughs> think about, you know, your relationships with other people. Um, you know, I think it's, it makes a world of difference whether, you know, my parents really are my parents or whether my parents, my parents are just some images 
in a vat which have been constructed by a computer. I think that makes the world a difference. Uh, or th you know, think about something you care about in your life, some project or you know, your, your family or something, you know, a book you're writing or you, know, you wanted to, some achievement you've had or whatever. Now, imagine it's just happening in the vat. I think it makes the world a difference whether it's the real thing or not. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, we, we could say that there's a kind of a, there's a kind of reality, a sort of reality prime or something, but it's, it's, it's a, it's a pale, it's a pale thing when compared to the real thing. And we really do want the real thing, I think. Um, so oh, for some reason, my, it, it's not quite working when I click on them. So they're not coming up right away, but I guess what we can do is if we, if we wrap it up around there, cause we've gone over a little bit, um, there we go. It finally came up a few seconds later. <laughs> yeah, that's true. They do go out to get a loaf of bread, just like non-skeptics. And 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 this is what they do. They 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 the the ancient skeptics they differentiated between the sort of basically they weren't interested in the judgments the judgments that everyday folk have unpretentiously held. Right. I mean, their real attack is on the professors. Uh, right. It's the, the, it's the, people, the, the theorists, you know, the demagogues. It's the, it's it's the the, the people trying to control them, but ordinary sort of unreflective life, going about your business, buying loaves of bread, feeling cold, um, you know, feeling hungry, doing whatever you need to do just to live your life. They, they're not interested in that. Uh, and, and in fact, they, so the, the idea is that it's, it's the other stuff, this extra layer of assent that gets added to it when you start forming judgments about the world of a dogmatic kind. Um, that's when that's when uh, the, the the good life starts to get undermined, right? So it's these these everyday judgments unpretentiously held, like going for and the actions unpretentiously done, going for a loaf of bread. Yeah, they don't care about that. Very hard to make that distinction sharp, of course, but that's the distinction they have in mind. I, th I think that could be quite an interesting topic to sort of almost psychoanalyze as well. You know, is it this sort of resentment of? Um, ivory tower academia or something that they have and then so it's like well well i'm not too bothered about this it's just i you know i really wish i kind of had what's going on in plato's academy or something uh, and so or, or in the lyceum so i'm gonna um you I mean, know, it's, it's a very own. different perception of the good life to what the aristelians right. have of course the aristelians think that it's uh you know that actually good judgment is part of the good life right. but actually <laughs> You know good it isn't about good judgment it's about trying to avoid judgment of that of the, the relevant kind so if we if we wrap it up around there, then I, I guess we can set up in future um, at the time, presumably that's half an hour earlier, to maybe do an epistemology Q and A. And if people have all their questions and things, we can just exclusively go through those for an hour. Yep, I'd love that. And uh, sorry, I have to go right now. Yeah, it's absolutely fine. Don't worry. Yeah, thanks for your time. I'll I'll send you an email, and we can set that up. Um, for some point in the future. But other than that, thank you everyone for watching and uh yeah, stay keep keep in touch for um when when that appears in the in your YouTube feed for when uh, Duncan will be back on to talk about those things. Thanks everyone. Thank Bye.